Epidural steroid injections are commonly used to treat nerve pain stemming from irritated nerves in the spine. If you've heard of these before, or even have had one, stick around because you're about to learn some insider knowledge. In this video, I'm breaking down five secret or lesser known facts about epidural steroid injections or sciatica that are backed by research that often doesn't make it into the exam room. Hit the like button now and stick around until the end because I promise that you will understand these injections better than most doctors. I'm Dr. Jacob Neiman, board certified pain medicine physician, and this is Pain Explained. Here's something most patients never hear about. The grade of nerve compression visible on your MRI scan can actually predict how well these injections work. Research shows that patients with low grade compression, where the nerve is just contacted or slightly displaced, have about a 75% success rate with epidural steroid injections. But if you have high grade compression where the nerve is severely squeezed or deformed, the success rate drops to around 25%. A 2011 study published in Pain Medicine found this difference was statistically significant, with low grade compression patients being nearly three times more likely to get meaningful pain relief. Another study confirmed this pattern showing that patients with moderate to severe nerve compression had seven to 26 times higher odds of poor outcomes compared to those with minimal compression. Now here's the catch. Most doctors don't explain these MRI grades when discussing your scan. They might say you have a herniated disc, but not clarify whether your nerve is mildly touched or severely compressed. If your MRI shows high grade nerve root compression, it doesn't mean injections won't work per se, but it does mean you and your doctor should have realistic expectations and potentially consider other options sooner rather than later. Okay, nobody talks about this enough. After your injection, there's actually a pretty good chance you'll feel worse before you feel better. A 2011 study tracking over 4,000 injections found that increased pain was the most common side effect, happening in about 1% of cases. But other research suggests it could be as high as 18% for cervical injections or neck injections. Your pain might spike in the first 24 to 48 hours, which sounds scary. But here's what's happening, and it's important to pay attention. It's usually the volume of fluid we injected that increases pressure in a compressed space or simply a reaction to the steroid crystals themselves. The actual anti-inflammatory effect that kicks in around day three to five. So if you're judging the injection on day one, you're way too early. This next fact is something most patients don't realize. These injections aren't just about pain relief. They're also diagnostic, or what that means is they tell us interesting and important information. When we combine a steroid with a local anesthetic, it's called a diagnostic and therapeutic injection. If you get significant relief after the numbing medicine wears off, usually four to six hours, that confirms we targeted the right pain generator. But if nothing changes, that's valuable information as well. It tells us we might be looking in the wrong place. Literature on selective nerve root blocks or epidural injections that are used for diagnostic purposes shows that they can even help surgeons plan procedures when conservative treatment fails. So even if the steroid fails, but the local anesthetic works, it's not fully a failed procedure. It's actually really useful data that guides our next step. The next secret might surprise you. That whole series of three injections approach, it's not really based on strong medical evidence. In 2024, the Office of Inspector General found Medicare had paid $3.6 million in improper payments for excessive injection sessions. Current Medicare guidelines now limit epidural steroid injections to a maximum of four sessions per 12 month period. Not because that's the magic number, but because of coverage limitations. And here's what the research actually shows. If the first injection or two didn't help, doing more rarely changes the outcome. One study on repeat cervical epidural injections found benefits when done strategically at the two to three week interval for partial responders but random, repeated injections when there's no response, that's not really supported. Use these injections strategically, not habitually. 
Another hidden fact is that people think it's all about the steroid. But there's another factor that rarely gets discussed, the fluid volume itself. Back in 1930, a researcher named Evans discovered that when you inject fluid into the epidural space, it physically displaces tissue and can stretch nerve roots. A 2009 systematic review found statistically significant correlations between larger injection volumes and greater pain relief. This is called hydrodissection. The fluid physically separates inflamed tissue from the nerve root. So two doctors could use the exact same steroid and dose, but if one uses three milliliters and the other uses six, you might get different results. However, and this is important, one study showed that smaller volumes with higher steroid concentration actually worked better than diluted larger volumes. Just know that it's not just about what you inject, it's the balance between volume, concentration, and precision of placement. If you guys made it this far, I'm rewarding you with a bit of bonus information. Let's talk about something that affects whether you can even get these injections. Insurance coverage. Most people don't realize that insurance companies, including Medicare, have very specific medical necessity criteria you need to meet. First, you need to have failed at least four weeks of conservative treatment. That means physical therapy, medications like anti-inflammatories, activity modification. You can't just walk in and get the injection. Second, you need imaging confirmation, usually an MRI or a CT scan showing structural problems like a disc herniation or nerve root compression. Your symptoms alone are not enough. Third, the injection must be performed under X-ray or CT guidance with contrast dye. No imaging guidance? Insurance won't cover it. Now here's where it gets interesting. Medicare limits you to a maximum of four injection sessions in a 12-month period. Some private insurers allow six, but for example, Blue Cross requires you to wait at least 30 days between injections. And if you want a repeat injection, you need to document in the doctor's note at least 50% pain relief lasting at least three months from the previous one. Otherwise, insurance considers it not medically necessary. Cost-wise, if you're on Medicare Part B, you'll pay 20% coinsurance after meeting your deductible. For 2025, that deductible is $257, and the average out-of-pocket cost for patients is around $1,000 per injection. The bottom line is, before you get scheduled, make sure your doctor's office verifies all these criteria are met. Otherwise, you might be stuck with the full bill. If this helped clear things up for you, the next step is knowing what to actually expect before, during, and after the injection. So click right here for my next video where I break down the complete timeline of what happens with these procedures. And if you found this valuable, hit the like button and subscribe. I break down complex pain management topics like this every week. See you there.